Hi, we're not on the range and we're not at our training facility. Today we're in the field. And if I've timed this correctly, today's presentation will air on Thursday morning. So today is the 2020 Thanksgiving special. And it comes with a long list of caveats, disclaimers, yabbits, and a couple of explanations. The first explanation is, you may notice that I'm not dressed the way I typically dress. That's because in a few minutes we're going to do some Dutch oven cooking, and I presume that I'm going to get covered with soot and or flour and or grease, so I'm wearing some clothing I'm a little more willing to destroy. There's also the concept of today's operation. Today's presentation is made with the mindset that if you're watching me, you're sitting at home bored because you're not visiting your family, or they're not visiting you, and or you're not a football fan, so you're watching me. And we're going to try to alleviate your boredom, hopefully not add to it. Today's presentation also takes into consideration that your family might be visiting you and you're hiding from them watching me. So we're going to make a longer presentation to take up some of your time. However, with a lot of material to cover and very little time to film it, we really are on a time hack, that means I don't have the time to go back and refilm all the things I screw up. Also, I'm going to be doing some Dutch oven cooking, which has to be done and has to be filmed in real time. And if I screw something up, it's not like I can go back and cook it again. So today's presentation may not be as polished as you're accustomed to. I have a very bad habit of tripping over words and transposing letters and syllables. And sometimes you'll hear me say things like, this is my with and smessen revolver. And when I say something stupid like that, I just cut and refilm the whole thing. Today, I just don't have the time to do that. So you really are going to have to put up with my Shatner-esque pauses and my very annoying habit of transposing syllables and letters and tripping over words. Now, today's presentation is also made with the presumption that you're not a third grader. So I would appreciate it if we didn't spend a lot of time in the comments making fun of the way I talk. Okay, with that, Let's do some Dutch oven cooking. There's two things of paramount importance when it comes to Dutch oven cooking. One is that there's a degree of unpredictability when it comes to cooking anything in a Dutch oven. If you're going to go into the field and you're going to take your Dutch oven and you're going to take a cake mix and you're going to bake a cake, I would tell you don't bring a cake mix, bring two cake mixes. So when you screw up one of them, you've got a spare. There's a degree of unpredictability when it comes to Dutch oven cooking. Two is time and timing. Now, 2A, time. You have to cook things for the appropriate amount of time. And your cook time can vary greatly depending on your Dutch oven and your environmental conditions. Right now, it's about 25 degrees. My cook time is going to be significantly more than it would be if it were, say, 75 degrees. There's also a slight breeze blowing. So my cook time is going to be increased a little bit because that breeze will blow away some of the heat from my charcoal. If there was a significant wind blowing, my cook time would be significantly more. And you have to cook things for the appropriate amount of time. I've seen things that were undercooked, and I've seen things that were even worse, overcooked. If something's undercooked, depending on what it is, you can put it back on the charcoal and maybe salvage it. If it's overcooked, it's just ruined. Time is very important. Now, 2B is not time, but timing. You have to do things in the right order so that when you're cooking several things in different Dutch ovens, they'll all come out reasonably close to the same time. And you have to do things in the right order to most efficiently utilize your time. This can be a very time-consuming process. So, in talking about timing, the first thing I'm going to do is get my charcoal going before I even start assembling whatever it is I'm trying to cook. Now, to get my charcoal going, I've got this great charcoal lighter. Put the charcoal on the top, paper in the bottom, fire it up. You don't need lighter fluid or anything like that. It can be a really handy device. And yes, I know I've demonstrated this before. But we're going to demonstrate it again. So I'll put some paper under it. Always keep some paper in the charcoal. put some charcoal. Now, because I'm starting out with the big Dutch oven and cooking something big, I'm going to get a lot of charcoal going.
and it takes a while for this charcoal to get to where it's ready to cook. And when you have a charcoal lighter like this, you have to monitor it for a couple of minutes because sometimes when you set it down, it'll just put the fire out. You also have to be aware of your conditions before you set this fire on the ground and get your pine needles burning. Now, this environment has been pretty wet recently. There's some snow, it's very cold. I'm not too worried about getting a fire started. I'm more concerned with getting the intentional fire started. But now that this is going, Let's assemble what we're actually going to cook. So now I've got the charcoal going, and I have to get all of our ingredients put into our Dutch oven and have it ready to go at about the same time that the charcoal's ready to go. Also, remember I said at the beginning there are certain things that I can't redo. This is one of them, so bear with me. And what I'm making today is mandarin orange duck. And yes, this is a recipe that I made up. So the first thing we have to do is get our duck out of his packaging. And now this is labeled as a duck, but I gotta tell you, it is bigger than any duck I ever shot. And get that out. Oh, they even included some all natural orange sauce. I was unaware of that until just now. Now, if you hear this crunching around in here, it's an important thing to get your duck thawed, but not too warm. And some of his innards are still a little frozen. Imagine that, that he didn't thaw that efficiently on a 25 degree day. So. Get some of our duck innards out of there. And some people think that duck liver and such things are really good. I don't. Now, a very important thing in Dutch oven cooking is to avoid burning the bottom of whatever it is you're trying to cook. That is a very common thing that happens. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to line the bottom of the Dutch oven with bacon. This will, to some degree, flavor what we're trying to cook. And what it really does is it just acts as a buffer between the heat and the product. So if I burn my bacon to a crisp, so what? it won't burn the duck. Does anybody remember that episode of I Love Lucy where Lucy wanted to go camping and or hunting with Ricky? And she brings Ethel along to help her look like she knows what she's doing. And Lucy proclaims that she can shoot a duck on the wing. Meanwhile, Ethel is hiding, ready to throw the duck out. And Lucy says, there goes a duck, and she shoots. And then Ethel throws the duck and it lands on the ground at their feet, only to discover that it's an already plucked <laughs> and gutted bird. Yeah, if you're old enough to remember that, don't admit it. Okay, now we've got our bacon in here. And what we're gonna do is stuff our duck with mandarin oranges. Oh. And when you go to the store and buy mandarin oranges, make sure you get the seedless ones. 
stuff those in there. And then put our duck in the pan. Then we'll take the rest of our mandarin oranges and mix them up a little bit. Interesting thing too, when I opened the bag of mandarin oranges, one of them wasn't a mandarin orange, it was a tangelo. I don't think that'll ruin our recipe. Stick all these things in here. And whether or not anyone's going to want to really eat a baked mandarin orange, eh, who knows. But the main thing is that they will flavor our duck. Then we we'll take our all natural orange sauce. Cut that open. And let's dump that in there. Okay, and then we'll put just a little bit of salt, and you have to really carefully measure the amount of salt you put in. and a little bit of pepper. Good. Now let's go check and see how our charcoal is doing. So our coals are in good shape. And you see how this ground is kind of sandy? Normally I'd want to put something under the legs of the Dutch oven so they don't sink into the sand because you don't want the charcoal touching the bottom. But today the ground's frozen, so we're okay. Put some charcoal on the ground. Yeah, there's one of those moments you can't retake. Put the Dutch oven on there. Make sure all the charcoal's under it. Try to get it as level as you can. And put our charcoal on top. Now, this isn't enough, so I'm going to start some more charcoal. So now we've got more charcoal going, and I'm gonna move on to the next thing we're doing, which is cinnamon rolls. Now I'm going to make a baking powder dough, not a yeast dough. Yeast is time consuming, and we really are on a time hack here. And under these types of conditions, yeast just doesn't rise very well in the field. So I'm gonna start out with flour. And this canned flour is very nice to have in the field. I don't have to worry about vermin getting into it. I don't have to worry about it getting wet. There's a couple of things you have to be aware of is that this type of canned flour will have a desiccant pack in it. And you gotta get that out of there. That is no fun to bite into the desiccant pack. Yes, I have done it. And some of these will have two desiccant packs. So you gotta make sure you're paying attention. Okay. Now, the recipe typically calls for shortening. I'm going to use margarine instead of shortening. And before you have a fit, yes, I do have butter and I'll use that later. But at this stage, I find margarine works a little better. So we'll get our pastry blender and we'll cut in this margarine. And one of the things that a lot of people do, myself included, is they'll get carried away with this, especially when you've got a holiday thing going and there's people over and you're talking to people or you're concentrating on what's going on. Or you're out here, second desiccate packet. And you get working on things like this. And you forget to put in your baking powder. That is no fun. And like so many other things, the baking powder must be measured correctly. People will also forget to put in salt. Now when you put in salt, a lot of things will call for a quarter teaspoon or a half teaspoon of salt. Uh, yes, you need salt, but usually a lot less than what the recipe calls for. 
I don't want it to taste salty. And then I'll continue to cut in my margarine. And I may have mentioned this before. Something you learn in junior high school cooking class is, that's a test question. What is a pastry blender for? Blending pastry? No, that's the wrong answer. It's for cutting in. Which seemed silly to me at the time, and now, a little while later, it still sounds kind of silly. We get that all cut in. And the pastry blender, that flour, and margarine or shortening or whatever it is you're using will stick to that so it's nice to wipe it off just a little bit right to start with then i'm going to open my can opener and put in the milk And it's debatable whether or not you want to put in the milk first or put in your spices first. And we'll add more spices later, but into the dough itself I'm going to put in just a little bit of cinnamon. This will make more sense as we go along. And now... And of all the neat gadgets out there for your kitchen, I found that the best thing for this part is just a fork. And as we mix that together, we get kind of a batter, but we really want a dough, so it needs a little more flour, which is good because I saved a little bit. about where we want it. Once I get it mixed like this, The guy was trying to tell his girlfriend, I need you like pizza dough. Yeah. <laughs> if you want a second date, probably not the right thing to say. Can we get this done? No, I'm still going to use just a little bit more flour. And that's about where we want to be with some dough. What was that other thing that the guy said the way you make dill bread is with dill dough? Yeah, sounded stupid when I heard it too. Now, one of the problems with canned flour is I had to open this can. I won't use very much of it. I'm 
going to take our cutting board that we had before, and we're going to flower that pretty well. Should be easier under these conditions to find the desiccant pack. There we go. And I'm going to put the dough on the cutting board. And then I'm going to roll it with our field expedient rolling pin. where the butter will come into play. Ideally for this part, the butter could be melted, but in this case, that's just not going to work out very well. So we'll get some of the butter out. And we'll just put the butter Now this canned butter is from a brand called Red Feather, and it's not anything special, it's just butter, it's not even salted butter, and it comes in a can. Very handy for use in the field. I'm going to break that up so we have smaller chunks. Get a lot of butter on here. Okay, our battery went dead. Now I've got a new battery. And we're still in the process of putting some butter on our cinnamon roll dough. Now, I talk about how we're under a time hack and I don't have a lot of time to film all of this kind of stuff. Well, my schedule has been hampered lately by the fact that I've gone back to work at a dental clinic. And it really is annoying how much work can interfere with my play schedule. Okay, now we got enough butter on here. Some people would argue there's never enough, but I think that's enough. And now, we will sprinkle this with our cinnamon. And cloves. Now, cloves are something that some people like to add to cinnamon rolls. When you do, be stingy with the cloves. A little goes a long way. Then, then because I'm going to use very little, keep this in a baggie. And this is a mixture of ginger and nutmeg. And this is something that I will use a very small amount of. Now, what I'll do is I'll just 
roll this up. then we'll put it in our Dutch oven. A very important thing is, just like the bacon we put in with the duck, we don't want anything to stick to the bottom of the Dutch oven. And not only do we not want it to stick, we don't want it to burn. And there are various ways to deal with the possibility of it burning. One of those ways is always make sure you put more charcoal on the top than on the bottom. But what I'm going to do is I'm going to put this flour tortilla on the bottom of my Dutch oven. And of course, they didn't make the tortilla the exact right size. I'm gonna trim it a little bit. And this way, I can again burn this tortilla to a crisp and the bottom of my cinnamon rolls won't be burned. Now, there is the problem that the cinnamon rolls might stick to the tortilla, so I'm going to generously flour this. There we go. And then I will take my knife, get the orange glaze off it, and I will cut the cinnamon rolls and put them in the pan. And when these come out, they will not look like something that's going to be worthy of putting on the cover of good housekeeping, but they will taste pretty good. And we'll just go like that, and we'll check on our charcoal. And our charcoal looks pretty good. And I'll put a few of the coals on the ground get my high-tech coal moving tool, get them in the right position. And even though I've got the tortilla on the bottom of the pan, we still want significantly fewer coals on the bottom than we have on the top. Set the Dutch oven just like that. Check our time, okay. And then take the rest of these coals and put on our duck. And the duck is still gonna need more coals, so we'll fire up a few more charcoal. Now I'm preparing some more charcoal, and while we're waiting for that, we'll go to our next project, which is making a cake. Specifically, a pineapple upside down cake. Now I'm going to start with yellow cake mix. And there are people who will complain that we should make the cake from scratch and blah, blah, blah. In the field, cake mixes are far more convenient. And always remember, before you throw the box on the fire, there's some instructions on there you might want to read. And these instructions call for a third cup of butter, softened. Softened might be hard to achieve under these conditions. Put that in there. And we'll go back to our pastry blender to not blend it, but cut it in. And 
as I expected, even though I did warm up that butter a little bit. It's not warmed up enough. Now we're doing a little better. about there. Sometimes I can be cavalier about measuring things, but water, in this case, you really do have to measure. And it calls for three eggs. No, I've never mastered that crack in the egg with one hand. put in one third cup of water, as I say, you have to measure it. But now looking, I misread the box. It's not one third cup, it's one cup. So we'll add two thirds cup more. And that makes a lot of difference. really should read the instructions and not all cake mixes are the same some will call for two eggs three eggs some say a third cup of water some say one cup some will call for vegetable oil this one specifically called for butter mixy 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 Now, I've noticed that when I've done this before, a lot of people complained about the mixer. 
saying that a wire whip would work better, and yes, it will. The mixer has other uses. But to be perfectly blunt, this mixer was given to me, and so I have to be able to say, yes, I used that mixer you gave me. Now there's something I'm going to do for this recipe, and we don't want it to taste cinnamony, but I'm going to add just a tiny bit of cinnamon, and I mean that literally, just a little bit. Once we've got our cake mix mixed, set that over here and prep our Dutch oven. And what we're going to put in the Dutch oven is the pineapple upside down part. Normally I'd like to use a fresh pineapple and cut it up, but I find for the cake, the canned pineapple is just more consistent. Now, I've already drained the water off these cans of pineapple. And when I put in the second can, that looks like plenty. It isn't. When you think you have enough, you don't have enough. And I'm going to... All situated like that, and that looks good. Now, here's a really important ingredient. Molasses. And I keep this in my pocket. <laughs> now I've got butter on my hands. I keep this in my pocket. There we go. To get it warmed up enough, because I said that molasses won't flow in January. Well, a lot of times it won't flow in November either. And this is one of those things I'm just going to drizzle this over the pineapple. adds a really good flavor to the pineapple upside down cake, but you don't want the whole thing to taste like molasses. So just a little bit. Now, once we've got that in place, put in the cake batter. You have to remember, of course, that the cake batter will rise. So you don't want to get this too full to the point where when it rises during baking that it hits the lid of the Dutch oven. So depending on your Dutch oven and which cake mix you use, might not be able to use the entirety of the cake batter. There we go. Let's go check on our charcoal. And now our charcoal's ready to go. Put some of that on the ground. Remember with the fruit on the bottom type of cake like this, you're not as likely to burn the bottom so you can have a few more coals under it. And the heat has to get through that pineapple to cook the bottom of the cake. So a few more coals are indicated. Make sure all our charcoals are under it. Put some coals on the top, but not too many. Throw the rest of them on our duck.
speaking of our duck, let's check it out and see how it's doing. Now our duck's been cooking for just over an hour. So we're gonna take the lid off, see how it looks, and add our vegetables. And he's not done, but he's looking pretty good. And the vegetables in this case are just going to be different types of potatoes. And they will, to some degree, cook in the duck grease. And of course, we'll cover those potatoes with bacon, because that will flavor them. And as the bacon cooks, the bacon grease will help cook the potatoes. You can always be very generous with bacon. Some ingredients, like cloves, you might want to be stingy. Bacon is an ingredient that you can be very generous with. There's no reason to save this much bacon, we'll just put the whole thing in. is one of those occasions where the saying, save your bacon, is not necessarily a good thing. Then we'll put our lid back on, check our time, and then we'll check it again about the time I think the potatoes will be done. So now the cinnamon rolls are done and I've let them cool off for a while. Let's see how we did. And this is the real moment of truth. First, we see that they haven't stuck to the pan. That's a good sign. And I'm going to take them, just dump them out upside down on the lid, peel off our tortilla, put them on the plate, and it looks like we did pretty well. Now I've got some more charcoal prepping and I'm going to bake another cake. I know today's the Thanksgiving special, but Thanksgiving is supposed to be the beginning of the Christmas season, so I'm going to bake my perception of a Christmas cake. And that starts with this Betty Crocker Delights super moist triple chocolate fudge cake mix with the declaration on the label, there's pudding in the mix. So let's see how we do. And again, we have to start with, don't throw the box in the fire. There's instructions on there you might need to read. And if there's pudding in the mix, it must be in powder form. So this requires three eggs. This time, let's read a little more carefully. A half cup of vegetable oil. Now I have found that when a recipe like this calls for a half cup of vegetable oil, I can put in just a little bit more and that will make it a little bit more moist. Even though since this is supposed to be super moist and there's pudding in the mix, maybe that's not necessary, but I'm going to do it anyway. It also calls for one and a quarter cups of water. this up.
Now, this is a cake that I do not want to stick to the bottom of the Dutch oven, so we're going to grease the bottom of the Dutch oven. And I didn't put any margarine out on the table. I got to go get some. And now I've got a stick of margarine. And again, people can complain that butter is better, but really, for greasing the pan, I think margarine is the superior product. And you don't want it to look like a fresh from China SKS with a cosmoline still on it, but you want to be generous. We get our butter in there. There we go. Set that off to the side. Wipe the butter off my hand. And then we'll put in our cake mix. Now again, we don't want this cake to stick to the top of the pan. And this becomes very important, the cake I'm making right now. So I'm not going to use all of the cake mix, most of it, but not all. And then I'm going to add something to it. These are Signature Reserve Extra Dark Chocolate Chunks. And I'm not going to mix them in with the cake mix. And they're not chocolate chips, they're little chunks. They look like, what do you call that, a chunky candy bar, except in miniature form. I'm not going to mix them in, I'm just going to put them on the top. Make sure I get them fairly evenly spaced. And I'm not going to use them all. We want to maintain some semblance of cake here. And then we'll bake this. And again, our charcoal is ready to go. And in this case, we really do want just a few coals on the bottom. Typically, I wouldn't even use this many. But in this case, because it's cold outside and we have just a little bit of breeze, just a little bit, I'm going to use more than I usually would. And we put most of the charcoal on the top. Now, let's take a look at how our potatoes are doing. So now our potatoes have been in here for about half an hour. Let's see how they're doing. They're coming along, but they definitely need some more time. So I'll put some fresh charcoal on the top of this and some under it and give it probably about 20 more minutes. And while we're waiting on our potatoes, let's take a look at our pineapple upside down cake. Now, when I look at it, it did get a little brown on the top. Let's take a close-up look at that. And here we see it's a little brown on the top, but not even close to what I'd call burned. Definitely within acceptable limits. But let's see how the bottom of the cake looks. And it's definitely done all the way through and has a lot of pineapple. Looks like it turned out pretty well. Okay, let's check our duck and our potatoes one more time. Obviously, great care must be taken when taking off that lid. You don't want that dust in what you're cooking. Look at our potatoes. And they're not mushy, but they're definitely cooked. And our duck is definitely done and he's still stuffed with mandarin oranges. Looks good. We'll take that off the heat. And we'll let that sit a while, what some people will call letting the bird rest. So I've let this rest a few minutes. Now I'll show you a close-up of what it looks like. And here's our crisp bacon. Here's our duck. I cut it to make sure it was done. He's still stuffed with the mandarin oranges. And we see our various sizes, shapes, and colors of potatoes. Looks really festive.
So let's try some of this. Get some crispy bacon. One of these little red potatoes. Here's some cooked mandarin orange. We'll see how that turns out. Let's cut off some of this breast meat. Now, when you're cooking a bird in a Dutch oven, there's certain birds like chickens or turkeys where there's a window. It's not done, not done, then it's done, then you have a certain window until it becomes overdone and really dry. And that window can be fairly narrow. But when it comes to a bird like a duck, a duck has a lot of grease in it, that window is much wider. And so having the absolute correct time isn't so crucial. But anyway, let's taste this. Cooked mandarin orange. Mmm. Tastes terrible. Bacon. Very good. Remember this potato cooked not only in the bacon grease, but also the grease of the duck. Not bad at all. And finally, the duck. Mmm. Damn. I guess I shouldn't look surprised, but that turned out really well. One more thing to do, and that's the chocolate cake. And remember, this is one of those things that I have to do in real time, and I can't redo it, so bear with me. First, you have to make sure the cake has cooled completely. That can take a while when we're talking about a Dutch oven. This cast iron can hold a lot of heat for a long time. But it's a cold day, I've got some snow around, I just set it in the snow and now it's cooled off. And I'm gonna frost it with this Betty Crocker rich and creamy frosting, and according to the label, the flavor is creamy white. That does not sound appetizing at all. However, I'm gonna modify it a little bit so it'll be okay. I'm gonna take it out of its original container. And this might seem like too much for this cake, but I'm of the opinion that it's okay to put too much frosting on there because if someone's going to eat it and they don't like that much frosting, they can take it off. But if you have too little, yeah, then you're stuck. Always better to need, to have and not need. That's one of those things where I talk about I trip over words. That's what I was talking about. So we put that in the bowl and then we're going to add some pure mint mint extract. Two tastes that go great together are chocolate and mint. Oh, when you're peeling this piece off, don't peel it off over the bowl. You don't want to get too much in there. So, I'm going to put some mint into our creamy white frosting, making it creamy white mint frosting. And stir that in a little bit. Now, I did try to warm this up, but had moderate success. So we get that mixed in a little bit. Then we're going to add to it some green food coloring. And I know that seems kind of chintzy, but if you're trying to make a Christmas cake, green is festive. Let's see what we can do. And so far, it doesn't look too good, but hopefully it'll look better by the time I've worked with it for a while. Now, some people might say that it's cheating to use pre-made frosting, and very often what you can make yourself will be better. But when cooking like this in the field, buying a product makes life a lot easier. And as long as you use a reputable brand, most of the time, it's going to be okay, as far as taste. So we're going to mix this in. 
and this is one of those projects that I can tell I'm going to be here a while, so I'm not going to make you watch the rest of this. Okay, I've got this frosting mixed up, and it's warmed up a little bit. I actually had to set it on some of the charcoal for a few minutes. Charcoal's pretty well cooled off, but there was still enough heat to get that into a consistency that I might be able to spread on the cake. Then, we'll put it on the cake. You can tell it's a very delicate operation. Oh. There's a thing about food in general, especially when cooking in the field, that taste, of course, is the most important thing. I guess second in importance to making sure that the food hasn't gone bad. But when you're making something like a cake, how it looks when you present it is also important. And that reminds me, you'll hear people say the proof is in the pudding. No, it isn't. The way that saying goes is the proof of the pudding is in the eating. And that's very true. It's a cliche that holds true more so than most cliches. However, with a cake, it not only has to taste good, it has to look right. And that is a thing with frosting a cake like this, especially under colder conditions, is that the top of the cake can become a little crumbly. And then it gets mixed up in the frosting and you have all these chocolate bits in your green frosting and it just doesn't look right. So you have to take some time and care to spread this frosting out carefully. And again, this is a time consuming process. but it has to be done carefully and it really should look right. Now, if you're in the field and you're making a chocolate cake with mint frosting and somebody wants to bitch about the way it looks, well, then I guess they can go without cake. But still, if possible, you really do want it to look right. And there is an art to spreading frosting like this especially when it's cold frosting, probably not the best frosting. And doing anything when someone says there's an art to it, well, that becomes especially difficult for someone like me who has absolutely no artistic talent. Someone suggested that part of a video or two should be a campfire sing-along. And I had to point out, no, one of the objects is to get people to watch the video. So, we spread this frosting, and we're doing okay. Gotten a little bit of chocolate crumble going on, but not too bad. And I'll be able to cover that up. And there we go. Now, green is kind of Christmassy, but we also want to make it look somewhat festive. And we want to make sure that we have sufficient amount of chocolate in our chocolate cake. So we're going to garnish the cake with a few things, one being chocolate chips. Not only do these look good in the sense that people say chocolate chips, can't go wrong with that, it covers up the one or two crumbles of chocolate cake that I had showing. Then to really make it festive, we pop this open and we've got some little red and white candy cane looking things. Let's shake a few of those on there. 
Then we've got some blue and white snowflakes. No, I mean, they're shaped like snowflakes. That wasn't implying anything. Put some of those on there. And that looks festive. Let's take a close-up look at it. And there you go. And yes, the way the cake looks is important. However, the proof of the hyperbolic chocolate cake is still in the eating. Let's give it a try. I discovered that it hasn't stuck to the side of the pan. And always in a Dutch oven, getting the first piece out is the most difficult. And we see that it hasn't stuck to the bottom. Maybe a little on the edge. It would appear that the bottom of the cake is not burned. That's a big plus. It is very chocolatey and very minty. That's like having a rifle that's pinpoint accurate and has a 30 shot magazine. Now we're back in the office and I have to film a segue. A while ago I filmed a presentation that we intended to show at a gun show. But of course with the beer situation the gun show got canceled. So we're going to add it to our Thanksgiving special. So let's take a look. Today, so please bear with gunfire here in the background, but fair warning, just about all I'm going to do today is talk. And I'm talking about a subject that hopefully has very little or nothing to do with firearms. I have been contacted by a surprisingly high number of people who've asked me to do a presentation on my advice for dating. Okay, so here we are. Now, I can give you some advice, but it comes with a laundry list of caveats, disclaimers, and yabbits, including but not limited to, first, when it comes to dating, I am talking about dating, I'm not talking about hookups. Secondly, I have some experience and some expertise in the world of dating, but I most certainly would not consider myself a subject matter expert. Third, any experience or expertise I do have is specifically in the vein of a man meeting women. I can offer no advice on any other aspect of dating. Fourth, I'm talking specifically to men, since that's the only aspect of dating I'm familiar with. And in doing so, men like to talk in analogies, and they understand analogies quite well. So I'm going to use some. I'm going to compare dating to hunting. I'm going to compare dating to fishing. And in doing that, I don't mean to dehumanize anyone or dehumanize the process, but that's the way men communicate quite well, which leads me to the next caveat that men, women, for the most part, do not like your analogies women very often consider them superfluous and confusing. And even more so, women really don't like sports analogies. When you're trying to make a point to a woman and you say something like, it's kind of like when you got 28 seconds left in the fourth quarter and you're on your own 30 and it's third and 19. Now, ladies, I'm sure a lot of you understood exactly what I just said, but the majority of women don't know, and don't care about anything I just said. Case in point, just a couple of days ago, I was out to breakfast. I was at a restaurant, and this restaurant was decorated with a bunch of sports stuff. I guess some of the local schools are having a basketball tournament. Well, I asked the waitress about it, and she said that she didn't care and that she didn't even know what sport was going on. And she said, and I won't get the quote exactly right, but she said something like she would rather have a gang of chipmunks chew off her skin than have to sit and watch a televised football game. Now, I don't mean to pigeonhole people into certain categories and say women don't care about this and women do care about that. People are individuals. 
Some women like country music. Some women don't. Some women like sports. They're real enthusiasts. Some women aren't. I can only go with the percentages. And the percentages is, I'm telling you, a lot more women are not sports fans than are. And so, men, women don't care about your analogies, and they most certainly don't care about your sports analogies. So with all that in place, let's get started. I'm going to give you my top five tips for dating. And remember, I mean for men meeting women for dating, not just hookups. And number one is just like the number one tip for deer hunting, go where there are women. If you're watching me right now, you're probably seeing me on a laptop computer screen at a gun show. And if you look around, you'll see there are women here. But the great majority of women that come to a gun show come here with their significant other. This isn't really the type of place for getting a date. You have to go where there are women. Now, point number two is you have to go where there are women who will be interested in you. And here's where I'm going to use a fishing analogy. Let me show you what I mean. I'm at the beach, and you probably can't see it, but behind me, about a mile offshore, is a charter fishing boat. People can get on the charter boat, they go out there, and they fish for bottom fish, lake cod, green lake, sea bass, the list goes on. And to do that, you need a certain type of tackle, certain pole, line, hook, lure, and so forth. But that's different than the fishing tackle you would use in other situations. Let me show you what I mean. But for a lake like this one, I've just been informed that there are some bass and some catfish and some perch in here. But as far as I know, the main type of fish in this lake are carp about this big. And to catch them, you're going to need a significantly different type of tackle than what you were using in the ocean. And for the bluegill or squawfish, or maybe even goldfish that would be in this pond, your tackle would be different than what you were using in the lake. I want to take a moment to talk about the importance of what kind of car you drive. Now, it comes with some caveats. First, I'm very well aware that not everyone can run out and buy the latest, greatest thing. Secondly, women will tell you that they don't care what kind of car a man drives, that they're not impressed by a cool car. Yeah, I could tell you my assessment of that, but I think a colleague of mine can say it better. Carol. What would you say to a woman who said that she doesn't care what kind of car a man drives or that she's not impressed by a cool car? Liar! 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 Yeah. However, what is cool is both subjective and generational. Let me show you what I mean. This is my 1972 Plymouth Roadrunner. It's got a 440 Magnum, it's got four barrel carburetor, it's got headers, and it doesn't have much in the way of mufflers. Now, if you were 17 years old and you were trying to impress 17 year old girls and it was 1983, this would be a cool car. But those same girls today are over 50 and when they see this, they might think it's really cool or they might think you haven't matured in the last 30 plus years. But for as cool as the Roadrunner is, for people in my age category, a vehicle like this one, as long as it's reasonably clean and in good working order, is probably going to make a better impression. So in fishing, as you go from one place to another, you have to change the tackle to catch the type of fish that are there. In dating, the metaphoric tackle is you. And you can change yourself to some extent. You can get new clothes, you can get contacts instead of glasses, you can get a toupee. But those things don't really help as much as a lot of people think they do. What you really have to do is be honest with yourself and with other people, and we'll come back to that. But you have to take a really good look at your fishing tackle. You have to look at your pole. Oh, wait a minute. Everybody laugh. He said pole. Ha, 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 ha. Okay. You've got to look at your pole. You've got to look at your tackle. And you have to honestly ask yourself, what kind of fish could I catch with this? Then ask yourself, where would that type of fish be? and then go there. Now to put that into a real world example, if someone were 20 to 30 years old, I might advise him that a really good way 
to get into a place where there would be a lot of women that would appreciate what he has to offer would be enroll in a couple of classes at your local community college, especially classes like biology, microbiology, anatomy and physiology. Those are prerequisite classes for a lot of healthcare fields like dental hygiene and nursing that have a very high woman to man ratio. And so it would be common if you took one of those classes that you'd be in a classroom with 40 people, 30 women, 10 men. That's a good ratio. But for people that are getting close to my age category, if I were to try to enroll in a class like that today, most of the women there would be 10, 20, 25 years younger than me and it wouldn't work out all that well. For people closer to my age category, a really good place to go is online dating. Now when I say that we have this resistance, a lot of people think that you have to be a complete loser to resort to that. And the only rebuttal I have to that is to say it's the 21st century and that's how it's done these days. And if you do that, you have to make an honest profile and put an honest picture on there. One that reflects how you really look, not how you looked 15 or 20 years ago. And if you do that, you open yourself up to really a world of possibilities of people who might appreciate what you have to offer. Now, one of the things that we get in this type of advice is that what if what you're looking for and what's looking for you is something different? Okay, let me tell you a Joe story. Now, for those of you who haven't heard of Joe before, he is a very real person. I just changed his name. Joe and I were in the Marine Corps together. After we got out of the Marine Corps, he went into the reserve component of the Army as an officer. He was an Army officer. And he was very proud of that, and he liked being an Army officer and all the things that went fit with that. The problem is, the kind of woman that he wanted to date, he wanted to date, what do you call that? A meadow muffin? Earth muffin. The kind of woman that wears patchouli, the kind of woman that not only knows what macrame is, but she does macrame, the kind of woman that has an herb garden. Now, those kind of women are out there. However, very seldom would that kind of woman want to date an army officer, and he had a lot of problem with what he wanted and what wanted him were not the same thing. And so if you are a 50-year-old man who's suffering from Dunlop, but you really want to date a 30-year-old woman with a bikini body, and you find that the kind of woman that wants to date you is a 50-year-old woman with gray hair whose headlights are perpetually on low beam, then what I would tell you is, instead of going this way and being frustrated with your failure, go this way and be happy with your success. Now that brings me to another analogy, and I'm going to use the analogy of spam. Now, according to the documentaries I've seen on television, spam, you know, the canned ham product, was introduced in the 1930s to moderate success. Where it really took off was during the Second World War when it was issued to American military personnel. They ate spam, they didn't really like it, but they ate it because it's all they had. And then they learned to like it. When the war is over and they're back home, they see spam at the grocery store and they buy it because they've learned to like it. And I would tell you, instead of starving, learn to like spam. Now, if you find that the kind of women that you're attracting are criminals or gold diggers, okay, obviously you have to change what you're doing. I didn't say learn to like rotten luncheon meat. I said learn to like spam. Now, let's go back to the concept of being honest with yourself and other people. That brings me to the point of telling tall tales, or what some people would call BSing. Doing that kind of thing can get you some success in the short term, but generally it's going to get you a lot more failure than success. When you're telling some woman a tall tale about all the things you never did, she might be there looking at you, oh wow, that's very interesting, while she's thinking what a loser you are. You are far better off to be honest with yourself and with other people. Now, that brings me to another topic I want to discuss. The next thing I want to talk about is dressing in fashion. Now you can see that nothing that I wear could be called fashionable. I dress totally for practicality, and that doesn't exactly turn heads, but it is being honest with myself and other people. If you're going to try to dress in fashion, there's some things you have to remember. First, I believe it's Albert Einstein that's credited with the saying, fashion is the bailiwick of the small-minded. If you're going to try to be fashionable, 
are small-minded people what you really want to attract. You also have to keep in mind that what's in fashion this week might be out of fashion next week. And there's the thing that what is in fashion can change with your geographic location and your age. Now, a friend of mine, he put quite a bit of effort into dressing what he thought was fashionably. Now, this is a 45-year-old man who comes to me and says, Hey, Paul, what do you think of my new threads? Well, the fact that he used the word threads ought to tell you something. And if you're seeking fashion advice from me, that's not exactly seeking sage advice. But I look at him and I say, Well, you look like a 65-year-old man in 1990. And then he's angry with me, and there we go. But the main thing is, if you're going to try to dress in fashion, you've got to be right. Now, there's one more topic I want to discuss, and that are your hobbies, your areas of study, your areas of interest. Lots of men have hobbies that we find interesting. Obviously, you find them interesting or you wouldn't do them. But we make the mistake of thinking that women find those things interesting. Now, of course, people are individuals. What one woman finds very interesting, another woman might find very boring. And so I'm talking in terms of percentages. But when I show the car and I say that the Roadrunner has a 440 Magnum, okay, that might be interesting to some people. But for the majority of women, they don't care about that. What they care about is, can they ride in it? Now, a good example, my neighbor has a 67 Mustang convertible that when he got it was a pile of rusted junk. And in fact, it wasn't really even close to a complete car. But through a lot of diligent, hard work, he's turned it into a pretty cool street machine. And I would wager that the majority of women don't want to hear about what rust preventative products he used and what parts he had to replace and what the term Boss 302 means. They want to know things like, can they ride in it? This same concept goes for a lot of the areas of study and hobbies that men have. Women really don't want to hear about them especially when they're those hobbies that you don't really do. For example, I know somebody that subscribes to Golf Digest magazine. He watches golf on television. He has a set of golf clubs, but he hasn't been to the driving range or the golf course in about 20 years. Women certainly don't want to hear about the hobbies that you don't really do. They don't want to hear about how fast your classic car can do the quarter mile and then find out that it doesn't really have an engine in it because you're having it rebuilt and the car doesn't move at all. They don't find that interesting. And there are a lot of areas of endeavor that men find interesting that women don't. A long time ago, I was reading a magazine article that was listing things that men think impress women that don't. And one of the things it listed was model railroading. And when I read that, I thought, you needed to tell somebody that? People didn't know that doesn't impress women? Now, if you're one of those people that builds those big dioramas, that's very impressive to me, the diligence and patience and skill that went into that. But the great majority of women are not going to find that interesting, and they might find it very childish. Another good example, I like dinosaurs. Now, I wouldn't consider myself a subject matter expert, but I can tell you things like Triassic, Jurassic, and Cretaceous periods, which are all part of the Mesozoic era. I can tell you the main differences between a Tyrannosaur and an Allosaur. But the problem is that when you're watching the movie Jurassic Park and a woman thinks the movie is just great, and in the film the kid says that this particular dinosaur is not a danger to them because it's a Vegisaurus, it's an herbivore, therefore not dangerous to those humans, yeah, then when I point out something like, okay, in the modern world, there's animals like the African elephant, the hippopotamus, and the rhinoceros, all of which are herbivores, and all of which would just as soon kill you as look at you. The idea that a brachiosaur or a triceratops poses no danger to those people because they happen to be herbivores is kind of silly. Now, when I say that, that might be theoretically sound, and it might even sound intelligent. But no woman wants to hear you busting on her movie that she likes so much. And she might find my liking dinosaurs to be rather childish. So the real thing is, although some people might find some things very interesting, for the most part, 
women are not going to find your hobbies or your areas of study or your areas of interest nearly as interesting as you do, especially when they're hobbies that you don't really do. So to recap, number one was go where there are women. Two, figure out what you have to offer and go where there are women who will appreciate what you have to offer. Be honest with yourself and other people, personal hygiene and wardrobe, your car, and nobody cares about your hobbies. So if you've sat through this entire presentation, thanks for watching, and I hope it could be helpful. And remember, we're just talking about my opinions. This was not in any way intended as a tutorial. Well, now it's the next day and I'm back to my normal attire and I want to finish the Thanksgiving special with a short discussion of what I'm thankful about. And remember everyone, this is not the format to discuss politics. Now, side note, when you were a kid eating Thanksgiving dinner, did you have to go around the table and discuss what you were thankful for? And always the first kid that got called on would say something like, I'm thankful for family and friends. And all the other kids would think, oh, he took my line. Well, I'm thankful that I never had to do that when I was a kid. Another thing that I want to discuss is, in the year 2020, we've had a lot of bad things happening. And I want to briefly discuss the beer situation. Now, obviously that's bad and it's done a lot of damage to a lot of people and a lot of damage to the economy. But there's a different way I want to look at it. For example, if I'm driving down the highway and I get a flat tire, instead of being put out by the fact that I got a flat, I'm going to be thankful that I had a lug wrench, a jack, and a spare, and that it happened on a sunny day, not on a rainy night. And I want to look at the beer situation like that. It happened at a time where, as far as I can perceive, the economy was in really good shape, and we were in a position that our economy could absorb a lot of the damage that was done by the beer situation. And I'm thankful for that. Another thing is, I discussed that when we're doing Dutch oven cooking, there's a degree of unpredictability. I'm really thankful that everything I was trying to make turned out okay. I'm thankful that I survived the sugar-induced coma that I suffered after eating the hyperbolic chocolate cake. But what I'm really thankful for is that you are watching me right now. Thank you, everybody, and happy holidays.